this computer. Um, so I really want to thank you um, for joining us today. So for everyone who has joined, um, most of the folks in the room at the moment are my students. Uh, this is uh, Tom Patterson, and um, we are lucky enough to have him join us uh, from here in Virginia. And I'm going to let you introduce yourself and give a little bit of your background. And then um, when you're ready, you can take over the, the button down at the bottom and share screen um, to share anything that you would like from your computer. Um, okay, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, um, hi folks. Uh, just just the uh, encapsulation of uh, who I am. Um, um, I'm now a retired National Park Service um, cartographer. I've been retired for about a, a year and a half now. And it's, I have to say, it's very strange saying I'm retired. You know, that, that was always something that was gonna happen way off in the future. And of course, uh, you know, it eventually does uh, come about. Um, about my education, I'm originally from New York State, went to one of the SUNY uh, New York State colleges for undergraduate. Uh, decided I wanted to escape the cold weather of upstate New York and uh, went out to the University of Hawaii uh, for my master's degree, uh, which I think was a nice move. Um, after uh, getting my master's from Hawaii, where I uh, was in cartography, um, by the way, my first job was with the uh, University of Utah uh, as cart lab manager at, uh, with the Department of Geography there. It was supposed to be a, uh, a stepping stone uh, position for a couple of years, but I, I, I loved the skiing and desert hiking in Utah so much and the job itself. I was, and I was teaching five classes and managing the, uh, the lab and doing all kinds of fun projects. So I stuck around for five years. And then after that, I, uh, I got into uh, US um, government. Um, the bulk of my career has been with the uh, US National Park Service. The office where I worked is located in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, about 50 miles uh, northwest of Washington, um, D.C. And it's a very interesting um, office, um, Harpers Ferry Center. Uh, it's, it's the center for all media services in the National Park Service. Um, so uh, people in my office would be you know, making maps, writing publications, doing outdoor signage, doing interpretive exhibits for visitor centers, movies, um, uh, historic furnishings for all 419 national parks in the system from Puerto Rico to uh, you know, Northern Alaska to Hawaii, down to American Samoa and all the way out to the Western Pacific uh, to Guam. So as a cartographer, you know, you know, making National Park Service maps for visitors was like you know, working in a candy store. I mean, you know, at any, on any given day, I'd have maybe a couple dozen maps that I was working on, on and off. And uh, it was just a, a great amount of fun. Um, eventually, I did retire. I mean, I, <laughs> that day does come. Um, but anyway, that's, that's um, my, my background in a nutshell. Oh, and I should say in my retirement, I'm still making maps. It's, it's, I'm, I'm very fortunate that uh, my, my vocation and avocation merged together. Um, I recently made a, a big map of Prince William Sound, uh, Alaska, for example. I just recently put out a, a data set based on uh, natural earth. So, you know, the mapping uh, continues more as a kind of a hobby uh, for me um, right now. So what I'm going to do um, today is I'm going to start off this, uh, this webinar, I guess we could call it that, uh, with a, a little presentation of about mapping um, Grand Canyon uh, National Park that I think you should um, find um, very interesting. Then after that, we'll, um, we'll open the, uh, the floor for questions and discussion. I think you, um, you read that article that I wrote uh, with all kinds of advice for students and uh, about mapping. Uh, we can talk about that. And then also I have a National Park Service map in Adobe Illustrator. And if time permits, after all of that, we could uh, open that up and you know, poke around a little bit and you could get an idea of what a map in Adobe Illustrator um, looks like. Okay, so without um, further ado, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen, everyone? Not yet. Okay, desktop one. Yes, now we can see it. Excellent. It's a Mac. <laughs> yes, it's a Mac. <laughs> 
Okay. And Okay, um uh, working for the National Park Service, I you know there's 419 national parks. I uh, didn't work on every one of the national parks, but I probably worked on a good half of them uh, throughout my uh, career. And you know what would happen is you'd get an assignment and uh, for doing a certain national park, and you would kind of that park would be yours uh, for all future updates and revisions and new maps that uh, needed to be done. And Grand Canyon was one of the parks that was in my stable of, of projects that I worked on um, over the years. So I'm gonna tell you uh, a little bit about uh, the most recent version of that, uh, of Grand Canyon mapping. And, and it's, it's one of the more unusual um, projects. So let's just uh, jump into that. Oops. So if you were to go to um, Grand Canyon National Park, say five years ago, this is the map that you would get when you uh, arrived at the uh, the entrance station to the uh, the park and as you can see it's a it's it's a pretty uh, typical national park service um, map uh, it shows the entirety of the park um, from uh, in the upper right lake powell all the way down to the lower left to lake mead the park stretches for 277 river miles along the colorado river you can see the, the park boundary in green. It's uh, kind of narrow in places, gets wider in, in others. It's a very unusual um, shape. And you can see that there's you know, symbols showing all the, the visitor facilities, you know, access roads to the park, et cetera, et cetera. This is a standard National Park Service map, you know, the type of map we make for almost all of our, our parks. And Grand Canyon came to me and said, you know, Tom, you know, it's, it's a nice map, but uh, it's not working at all for our visitors. And here's the problem. It's, it's a huge park, but the majority of our visitors go to one spot. You can see my, my mouse arrow where it's moving a little bit, uh, the Grand Canyon Village area. The park receives uh, 6 million visitors a year, and probably 95% of them go to the Grand Canyon Village area on, on, the, on the South Rim. And what's more, uh, most of the visitors stay for four hours or less in the park. So here they have this, this big park-wide map. It doesn't show the detail of the place that they're going. These people are just basically in and out uh, visitors. This map was not serving their needs at all. Something else was needed. And the park proposed that I create something that they call the South Rim um, Pocket Guide instead. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about um, today, uh, developing that guide and the, uh, the map for it. But before um, actually talking about mapping, let's look a little bit at um, Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, this is a sunset view from um, uh, Yavapai Point, and you know, in your mind's eye, I'm sure many of you have been to Grand Canyon National Park. This is what you imagine when you think of Grand Canyon National Park: just deep, intense colors, beautiful scenery, uh, you know, solace in the outdoors, just just a wonderful place. And this indeed exists at Grand Canyon National Park. There's a, an awful lot of this, but there's a, a another facet uh, to the park that we tend not to think about. And if you were to turn around from Yavapai uh, Point and look in the other direction, uh, about 100 yards away is the, the visitor center complex. You know, there's huge parking lots. There's, you know, this tangle of roads. It's, it's, a, it's a flat surface. It's on the uh, Coconino Plateau. It's forested. So visitors, if they arrive by car in this, in this you know, uh, this landscape that they're unfamiliar with, it's hard to navigate around. Um, so they definitely need a map to get from point A to point uh, B. There's another aspect of the park that people don't expect. Uh, uh, a lot of people going to the park are day trippers from uh, uh, Las Vegas or Phoenix or other uh, close by cities. They arrive by bus or the Grand Canyon uh, Railroad from Williams. Here we see uh, hundreds of people disgorging from these, uh, the train and these buses. And you know, the, uh, the, the, the Grand Canyon itself is, is probably two or 300 yards away, but you know, you know, how do you get from the train station here to the canyon? You know, obviously a map would be very helpful for that. 
Um, another thing about the Grand Canyon is that, you know, with 6 million visitors a year, it's, it's, it's a typical park. It's, it's, you know, overloved by people. It's, it's, you know, swarmed by people. And to relieve congestion, automobile traffic on the, uh, on the South Rim, uh, the National Park Service instituted a, uh, a bus service. There's four buses that are color coded. Here we see the blue route. And um, there's large areas of the South Rim where cars are excluded. So if you want to get around, you have to take these shuttle buses instead. So, you know, to get from, again, from point A to point B to point C, people need a map for navigating the, the shuttle bus um, system. And for the more active uh, visitors to the South Rim, there's um, also bicycling. There's a very extensive uh, network of what they call greenway trails uh, on the rim, not too close to the rim, because obviously uh, uh, you wouldn't want a bicyclist flying over the uh, the edge at all. But Tom, I think you may have frozen. Rim. It's it's essentially um, Tom. This, yes. For just a second, you froze just a second ago. Um, oh, we okay. Were talking on the last slide. Okay, uh, I was talking about the bicycling. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I just mentioned that there's uh, a a, ne a big network of bike trails on the South Rim. So moving forward, here's the uh, the map of the South Rim. The South Rim itself is the uh, area of the Ca Grand Canyon that's accessible by road. It extends uh, 32 miles from Hermit's Rest in the west to Desert View uh, in the east. And most of the activity on the South Rim is in the Grand Canyon Village, and we'll take a closer look at that right now. So here's a, an open street map uh, data dump of the Grand Canyon Village. As you can see, it's, it really is a, you know, a spaghetti network of roads and trails, lots of buildings. It's, it's a very complex place uh, to get around. Remember, it's flat, it's heavily forested, so you really can't see where you're, you're going um, very easily. And uh, there's a lot of people there. Um, believe it or not, uh, there's 2,000 permanent residents who live at Grand Canyon Village, uh, never mind all the tourists that are there as well. So, you know, if you were to you know, map this for tourists, you know, the first thing I would do is, is get rid of all of the stuff that has nothing to do with tourists, but, you know, is instead used for like uh, support infrastructure. So I'll do that right now. And that, I think, really helps out a lot. So if you wanted to get around, here are the, the roads that tourists take, and you could see the, the buildings that where the, the uh, tourist facilities are, are located. But when you look at this, um, this area, there's, there's three nodes that are also uh, you know, centers for uh, tourism, the visitor center, the market plaza, and the, uh, the village. So this brings up an interesting you know, question. Um, how do you map all of this. You know, we have the South Rim stretching for 32 miles from Hermit's Rest to Desert View. We have these three sections here. And, you know, the traditional way of mapping this would be to create a map something like this showing the entirety of the South Rim with, uh, you know, detailed insets of uh, these other places. But this gets to be a problem because you have Grand Canyon Village in the lower left, and then you would have inset maps of the inset map. And that's, you know, obviously not something that you want to do um, on a map at all. It would be very confusing. So I was, you know, pondering, you know, how to approach this, this cartographic problem of uh, lots of detail, uh, not much space. The map had to fit on a sheet of paper 17 inches wide. How would I get all of this information onto a sheet of paper? And one of the park rangers I was uh, working closely with um, uh, came back from vacation and said, you know, Tom, I've, I've got the answer for you. Um, the, the, we ought to emulate this map that I used on vacation, and I'll show it to you right now. He went to um, Disneyland, and he, he thought that the Grand Canyon uh, South Rim map ought to be much like the, the, the Disneyland map that he thought was just wonderful for getting around Disneyland. You know, obviously when I I saw this, I was 
pretty alarmed, tried to talk him out of it very, you know, gently. And it pointed out that, you know, there's some, you know, major differences between, you know, Disneyland and, and the Grand Canyon. For one, Disneyland is, is you know, human made and the Grand Canyon is a, a, a natural place. Disneyland is relatively small, whereas the Grand Canyon stretches for 277 river miles. It's a pretty big place. And, you know, also the little problem of uh, uh, design and style. This is not exactly the sort of style that a National Park Service map ought to project to the American uh, public. Um, although I have to admit that when you look down the lower right, the North Arrow with the mouse ears, I think that's uh, really pretty cool. So, um, you know, after some discussion, I persuaded uh, my park contact uh, that maybe we ought to follow a, a more traditional park service approach. And we looked uh, toward this guy here, Massimo Vignelli. Um, if you haven't heard about him, um, Vignelli was a, a, a New York designer. He did all kinds of design projects from um, you know, advertisements, product packaging, designing furniture, and also uh, um, publications. He, um, he's responsible for coming up with the publication system used by the National Park Service in 1977 called the Unigrid uh, publication system. We see some examples of that on the, uh, the left. Uh, it features that uh, black title band on all of our maps and brochures, which is instantly recognizable. It's the, uh, the brand that the National Park Service uh, uh, uses. And also Vignelli was a uh, proponent of, you know, very clean, almost minimalistic uh, uh, designs. And, you know, we thought you know, that would probably be better for Grand Canyon. And in fact, what I thought was really kind of cool, this is another project that Vignelli was involved with, involving mapping. In 1972, he, uh, he designed a version of the New York uh, subway map. And those of you who are aficionados of subway maps will recognize that this is a kind of a, uh, uh, a takeoff of Harry Beck's London Underground map from 1932. And what Vignelli did here is he, he created a highly stylized, very geometric uh, subway map uh, for New York. And one of the things that I found very interesting is look how he deals with Manhattan. Manhattan is a, a, a very narrow but long island north to south. And to fit all the detail into Manhattan, what he did is he, he made the island wider so uh, he, could, he could fit all the subway lines in there. So he, he's treating scale uh, elastically on this, which gave me an idea. I will also, as an aside, say that this map was not received very well. It was too geometric. People uh, wondered what all that beige color was. It, it's supposed to be water. Uh, and even back in the 1970s, New York Harbor was not that polluted. So subsequent versions of this map, you know, use blue water and the, and the shapes were, uh, the land shapes were definitely less uh, geometric. But nevertheless, you know, you know, I, I got the seed of an idea. What would happen if I did something similar at Grand Canyon South Rim and treated uh, scale elastically? And that's just what I did. I, um, I sat down in Adobe Illustrator and basically in, in, in one long day, uh, just sketching out uh, the road system and, and the Canyon Rim, this is the base map that I, uh, that I came up with. It, uh, uh, it, it is kind of like, a, almost like a caricature of the, uh, the South Rim. I'm, I'm really at this point departing from, <laughs> totally from geospatial uh, you know, mapping completely. Uh, I mean, you, know, you have to do whatever you have to do to get the, the, the job done. Um, so, you know, I, I used, you know, you know uh, geospatial reference maps to get all the shapes right and the relative uh, positions of things, but scale is not true on this. For example, remember Hermit's Rest and Desert View are 32 miles distant. Look at this, uh, this yellow oval. The, the width of that oval is about four miles. So what I did uh, is I greatly expanded the center of the map where most of the visitors go and treated Hermit's Rest and Desert View as appendages off, uh, off to the sides. And what's more, the, uh, the village, the market plaza, and the visitor center areas, in those second yellow circles, I expanded those even larger still so that I could uh, you know, get everything I needed into those small spaces and also fit in um, labels. 
Now you're, you're probably thinking that, okay, Patterson is really going off the reservation on this. You know, you know, how is this going to work? Uh, you know, how are visitors going to understand this? He's really playing with their minds. I will get to this in, in, in a few more slides, how I conveyed the idea that the scale is not consistent throughout this, uh, this map. So um, let's look at the base map now. Um, uh, in some ways, it's kind of standard. You could see the, uh, the, the buildings um, are represented by black footprints on, on the map. And uh, you know, the first thing I did is I removed these. And the problem with using you know, these sort of outlines, these footprints of buildings you know, as viewed from directly above is people don't recognize them. If you think about you know, where you are right now, presumably in your homes, uh, you know, would you recognize the shape of your house if seen from, you know, directly uh, above? Probably not. How you recognize your house or your classroom building or, or wherever is from the side, from ground level uh, as you're walking around. And so what I did instead is I replaced these building footprints with these little building drawings. Uh, they're kind of cute. They're kind of small. Um, you know, these things... Uh, uh, are really a pain in the neck to create. Um, they were uh, uh, drawn from um, photographs and highly um, simplified. I mean, these things are you know you know only maybe half a centimeter uh, wide on the map, so you couldn't get all the building detail into them. But you still had to capture the essence of any particular building in that in that very small form that you put on the on the map. Any one of these buildings, you know, might take from say an hour or two hours to to draft up to uh, an entire day for some of the more complex buildings with uh, unusual um, angles. Um, fortunately, I had some uh, volunteers helping me out on this, and they did most of this uh, drawing. One of the buildings that gave them a, a lot of uh, uh, there was a big challenge is that one on the uh, upper left. That's a uh, hermit's uh, rest, and I'll show you a photograph of it here. This was a building you know, created oh, in the early 1900s by uh, Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter, who was a, um, an architect who did a lot of these um, fanciful buildings on the south of the Grand Canyon that emulate the style of uh, Native American um, structures. So this isn't an ancient rune, but actually something you know created within the last century to look like a rune and there's visitor facilities inside of it. But you can see this thing looks basically like a pile of stones and you can look at the, you know, the building on the left, which you know kind of you know, distills the building down to its basic uh, form so that hopefully it's, that it's uh, recognizable at a glance. So enough of these little um, cute little buildings. And oh, I would say in, in another reason to, to put them up on the map is they are cute and people like to look at them and they, and they do draw your eye. So um, you know, one of the things you'll, um, you'll, you'll you know, um, you're looking at this map and you know, I thought it was coming along you know, pretty well at this point. And I, and I showed it to the, uh, the park staff and you know, believe it or not, I had about almost 100 people at Grand Canyon National Park giving me feedback on, on the map as it was being uh, developed. And one of the things that really surprised me was uh, people asked me, well, where's the, uh, the canyon? And you know, I thought it was just you know, completely obvious. It's that kind of that brownish you know, gradient up at the top. Um, and then the, uh, the rim of the canyon is that, the, that light green area in, in the foreground. You know, don't you see that? And, and apparently not. A lot of people didn't. And, uh, you know, th this is one of the truths of uh, map making. When you're making the map, everything is obvious to you because you're doing it. You know what you're representing. When, when other people look at it cold, they might not see things the same way you do. And if they don't see something that should be obvious, you know, the problem, you know, isn't with them. It's with the product that you're creating and you have to change it. So what I did is something very simple is I, I rendered some uh, 3D uh, terrain and just put a very light application of 3D canyon topography um, in the background. And this completely solved the, um, the problem. Uh, another thing, the next thing I put on this map was the black tidal band. Uh, Massimo Vignelli would approve of that. 
And at this point, uh, the, the, the base map was, uh, you know, pretty far along. Uh, now you'll notice that the map is, is very soft and pastel. The, the roads are white and they're very wide. And there's a reason I, I kept the, the colors muted. That's because the next element that I had to add were these bus routes that were color coded. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted the bus routes to, you know, you know, just pop out you know, at a higher visual level. So that, that was the reason why I kept all the other um, colors uh, muted. So right now, the, uh, the, the base map is complete, but it's lacking one very essential ingredient, and that's uh, labels and symbols. So let's um, add a few, uh, quite a few. Uh, again, there were about 100 people giving me feedback on this. All of them had their uh, different interests and agendas. Initially, I had about, oh, maybe 60% you know, of the labels that you see on here. And then, you know, over the months that this, this, this map was being produced, you know, incrementally more and more labels were added um, to the point where I was getting a little alarmed that the map would get um, too busy. But I think, I think it works out fairly well. Now, you'll note that uh, the labels, um, um, I really applied the, the whole idea of visual hierarchies on this. The, the places uh, that are most important are larger and bolder. You know, you could see, you know, Market Plaza, the Village, Visitor Center, Desert View, et cetera, with big, large type. Notice the, uh, the facilities that are found at each of those. Instead of putting, you know, um, each of those little symbols where they actually would occur on the map, if you're looking for an ATM, for instance, uh, you know, you would go to a specific corner. What I'm doing instead is saying, okay, if you're at Market Plaza, this is all the stuff that you will find there. You know, you, you won't be too far away from it. You know, you'll probably be with an eyesight. You can ask someone where the ATM is or the, uh, the restrooms and, and wherever you um, need to go. So visual hierarchies and, you know, the clustered symbols under the labels really draw your eyes to the, uh, these important um, places. So this is the, uh, the map, uh, but there's more to it if we um, slide it. Oh, actually, um, I promised earlier that I would discuss how I would convey the whole idea of distorted uh, scale on this map. So the first uh, thing I did, oops, wrong way, is I added these arrows up at the top the, and a label say map not to scale, it's bold, it's in red. Then I have these arrows showing the distances, you know, between the various places. Uh, this went out to the park for review, and it turns out no one noticed these arrows at all. I guess they were just looking at other places on, on the map. So I went back to the drawing board, and my second attempt was with this oval. I just put an oval with a drop shadow with a big label, say a large area, map not to scale. And this, this seemed to work uh, a bit better um, for most people. And in fact, this is what you know, the map was going to be printed with, but a week before the map actually went to the printer, I had another idea and I changed that oval uh, uh, from an elevated shape to a lens-like shape. You can see the, uh, you know, the 3D surface on it. It almost looks like you put a magnifying lens over the, uh, over the map, enlarging that area. And look, I, I brought the, uh, the arrows back too. So there's a certain amount of redundancy here. You know, most people will notice the magnifying lens, but if people want additional information, there's the arrows up above that tell them specifically the distances you know, between these various places. This seemed to work for like 99.99% of, of the people uh, reviewing the map. I was very pleased. Okay, let's, um, let's slide the map down. There's uh, more to it, uh, lots of additional information. Um, let's go through some of these um, things. Um, down in the lower left, there's distances. You know, because the map distorts uh, scale, uh, it was very important to show uh, you know, trail, bike, and road distances from point to point. So if you're driving from you know, you know, desert view to you know, the village, you would know that it's 2.1 uh, miles, uh, for example. So that's, all that information is conveyed uh, specifically. 
there's the usual uh, legend um, identifying what all the uh, services are. I will say that the uh, typical National Park Service map uh, does not have that many symbols on it. We try to keep them to a minimum to keep the, uh, the clutter down. Um, you know, maybe a, a typical map might have five or six different symbols that we, we have on it. Uh, Grand Canyon here has the record with uh, 21. I guess it makes this the best park map um, ever. Then there's the, uh, the North Arrow. Uh, no mouse ears, I'm happy to say. Um, you'll, you'll note that the, uh, you know, the North Arrow has North, West, East, and South labeled. The typical National Park Service North Arrow just has North uh, labeled. But because a, lo a lot of the, uh, the Grand Canyon visitors are uh, possibly new to using uh, maps, we thought it best to show the other cardinal um, directions. And you'll note that the, uh, the, 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 you know, the south rim extends you know, east to west. So we, we really wanted to show you know, west and east um, on the north arrow so people got their cardinal um, directions uh, correct. And then uh, there's this very large uh, section about the, uh, the free shuttle buses. Um, so people could uh, use these charts from getting um, around the, uh, the south rim. Now this was kind of interesting. Uh, remember, the, uh, the, the bus routes, like the South Rim itself, uh, largely go east to west. And so my, my initial uh, charts for the, uh, the bus routes were that thing, that, that um, object you see up at the top, uh, that you know, showed the, the bus routes and the stops in the sort of east-west uh, orientation. Um, I also you know, showed them that chart down at the bottom as an alternative. And the uh, the people to park uh, preferred the uh, the chart at the bottom instead of the uh, the one at the top, and so they were the client, and we went with that. Okay, um, here's a a sample of the map. My uh, my wife Val is serving as the um, the hand model on this. the The map it, when it folds up uh, fits into your shirt or pants pocket or into a purse or a knapsack. Uh, uh, very easily. This is one half of the map, the two top um, uh, folds that you can see. Um, I deliberately uh, designed it this way so when the map was folded in half, you could see all of the uh, really important stuff along the south rim on one half of the map. Tried to make it as compact and easy to use for someone walking around the park as, uh, as, as possible. So um, this uh, this was uh, this draft was finished uh, two years ago, uh, and the the park went and printed a trial run of three hundred thousand uh, copies that they used over the winter, uh, gave out to visitors, and uh, collected feedback um, at at the visitor center and the bus drivers and the rangers. They would ask people, you know, you know, you know, how's this map working for you and so forth, and they 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 got their comments came back to me. Um, fortunately, uh, the, the comments weren't that uh, great. I made a few tweaks um, to the map and they've, uh, they've since been printing it and handing it out to all visitors. Uh, the annual print run for this map is uh, 3.5 million copies a year. Yeah, you heard me. Three and a half million copies are printed every year. Um, that's a lot of a lot of maps, and and I will say if if you're making a map that's going to be uh, printed that much, uh, you really have to hope that there's no misspelled words on it. <laughs> it's, it's something that kind of keeps me up at night. <laughs> you know, if if they find a an error or a misspelled word, you know, they would have to reprint it, and that could be a a, a very um, costly mistake. So. Um, you know, to, to, you know, to cap things up, off, um, if you went to the Grand Canyon um, South Rim today, this is the, uh, the map you would get to, uh, to get around. Unfortunately, the, uh, the park is uh, now closed, like many places is, but hopefully uh, it'll be open before uh, too long. So with that, I will, um, I'll end this um, aspect of my talk and uh, stop sharing and if any of you have any um, questions I'd, uh, I'd I'd love to hear from you okay
Um, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> this is Shannon. Um, the, if anyone has a question, please feel free to unmute or to put it into the chat. Um, chat. Christine has put one in, in the chat and she, she said, how long did it take you to really make that map from start to finish? Yeah, you know, that, that's, that's, a, um, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, at any given time, I, when I was working for the Park Service, I'd be working on, you know, a couple dozen maps simultaneously. So, uh, you know, I would be, you know, I would work on one for, you know, you know, half the day or, you know, a week and then put it aside, send it out for comments, you know, sometimes have to wait three weeks to get comments back and so forth. So, you know, you know, giving a, uh, an, an hourly total is kind of hard to say. That map, uh, the, the whole project probably took about two and a half, three months from, from start to finish. If, if I was to be working on it, uh, you know, continuously, uh, nonstop, I would, I would say, you know, it, it probably would have taken me, you know, a couple of weeks to, to finish it. But I'll also say that, you know, you know, a lot of the ideas that came to me uh, was, were during those times that I, when I put the map down. And uh, you, you know how it is when you're not really thinking about something too hard, ideas pop into your head and you're out on a bike ride or taking a walk and it's like, aha, I'll, I'll do this instead. So having that sort of downtime, I think was, you know, essential on, on this project to, uh, to, to getting it done too. Apparently my uh, computer doesn't want to mute and unmute properly. So. <laughs> Um, the next question was, um, I'm going to tie one more to that one, and then another question has come up. Uh, up. Um, what was the most helpful feedback comment that you received? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I, 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 I've already mentioned it, and, and that was, uh, you know, showing the, uh, the Grand Canyon terrain in the, at the top in the background. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just thought, you know, Every would have, everyone would have seen it the same way I did, and uh, they didn't. So, uh, yeah, you know, if, if, if it's, you're making a map of the Grand Canyon and people don't know where the Grand Canyon is, that is a fundamental problem. I uh, appreciated that. I actually wrote, it, wrote down, you know, when you're making the map, everything is obvious to you. And that is such a great statement because I think it happens to all of us. Um, and that ties into the next question. Um, the question is, how did you render the Grand Canyon? Um, did you, and then what did you do in Illustrator or Photoshop to make the magnet, magnifying glass effect? Oh, okay. Well, the, the uh, render the Grand Canyon terrain. Yes. Um, okay, yeah, I, I, uh, I went to the USGS uh, National Map Downloader and downloaded a 10 meter digital elevation model of that section of the Grand Canyon. And I brought that into a program called Natural Scene Designer uh, that allows you to create uh, shade relief and also 3D oblique relief. So I, I, I looked at the Grand Canyon uh, from the south at, a, uh, at an oblique um, angle and rendered the, uh, the terrain out. And um, the terrain generally matches what you would see from that part of the south rim. But it's 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 also kind of uh, generalized too. And the magnifying glass, how did you? Yeah, th th that was um, that was done in um, Adobe Photoshop uh, using a, a lot of the uh, you know the filters that they have there. Um, you know, after this um, after this discussion, I'm going to be opening up um, Adobe Illustrator, and they have some similar filters there, and I'll sh I'll use I'll show some of those um, those graphical special effects that you have. Um, you know, I mean, the, the Adobe suite is, is, is really quite amazing for making maps. There's, there's literally no graphical thing that you can think of that you can't find a way to do it in, in those applications. Uh, there's almost too much temptation sometimes, especially for students, where it's like, wow, you know, I could, I could use, you know, vignettes and glows and drop shadows. And, you know, if, if you go overboard with this, you could have, you know, a, a map that looks, you know, just overwrought and uh, it, it would not be appropriate. So all these things are wonderful when used in, in moderation. 
Um, so one of the questions has to do with the negative feedback from visitors. Um, if there's anything that that is that comes up from visitors, how did you address it, or is there are there things that they suggested and you were like mm, maybe not as a cartographer? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Negative feedback from visitors is is a is a really tricky thing, especially in the National Park Service. Uh, you know, most of my former, all of my former colleagues in the Park Service are very uh, considerate and egalitarian. And when they're at the, uh, the visitor desk and someone comes up and they have a problem with anything, including the map, you know, the rangers, you know, really take note and write it, write it down and, and convey that information um, to me and my, my cartographic colleagues. And it's, it gets difficult. You know, if you've got six million people going to the park, and the rangers take note of 10 people who had negative feedback, do you really have a problem? You know, if, if you know, the, the other 5,999,000 are doing, you know, all right, you know, do you need to address these issues for that, you know, those, that handful of people? You know, we try to uh, within reason. Um, but we have to be judicious doing that. If we, if we make a change that, say, ruins the whole concept behind the map just because of one complaint uh you know you know you know you're you're basically you know um catering to the minority there and, and, and ignoring the needs of the majority so uh, um so it's 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 really hard to say uh but you know when we when we hear about you know problems we we do try to uh, address them and i, I you know I'll, I'll i'll admit to one problem that i i had <laughs> some years ago i made a, a map of um Devil's um, Post Pile. It's a park in the east side of the um, Sierra Nevada range in, in California. It and you know, when I was working on the map, I was, uh, you know, oftentimes what you do is you duplicate labels and re-edit them and you duplicate symbols and move them around and, and so forth. I made a nice little map of the, um, the park and, uh, you know, went through all the, the various reviews and edits and got printed. And uh, that next summer, the park started finding people walking around out in the middle of the woods. And they would ask, you know, you know they were getting lost and they were asking them, you know, what are you doing? And they said, we're trying to find the lodge that's out here. And I had actually put a lodge, I had uh, left a lodge symbol by accident, just out in this green empty spot place on the map. Oh. <laughs> and people saw it and started traipsing through the woods trying to find it. Uh, this is by far the worst error that I ever made on National Park Service map. And in, in, in that case, oh, the poor park staff, they spent that next winter, I think they had like 50,000 copies with white out, whiting oh. out all of these symbols. They, they were probably cursing me out all winter long. And then the following year, we reprinted it without that uh, errant symbol on the map. So, so it, mistakes happen to the best of us. So. It's true. So um, do you, one of the questions that came in is, do you follow a National Park Service color palette or do you have creative liberty with your color choices? Oh, good, very good question. If you had uh, talked to me 25 years ago in the National Park Service, I would say, yeah, we have a palette and, uh, and we follow it you know, rigorously. Uh, th that has all been thrown out the, uh, the window one of the things that we uh, do on our maps is we or we try to use natural colors. 25 years ago, every national park would have been shown as a green blob on the park. Uh, you know, Nash, uh, Grand Canyon National Park would have been a green shape. Death Valley would have been a green shape. You know, Great Smoky Mountains would have been a green shape. Now, you know, using green for Great Smoky Mountains makes sense. It's it's a it's a heavily vegetated, moist area. Grand Canyon and Death Valley, not so much. So what we've switched to is using natural colors that, that are more indicative of the environment of parks. So if you look at today's you know, maps of say, you know, arches or uh, you know, Death Valley, you'll see that there's more, you know, there's deserty colors in those parks. We'll use a little bit of green to show the park boundary because that's kind of a tradition. But uh, uh, we have a lot of latitude with the colors that we use. In, in fact, um, when we make the maps, they're, they're not done in, in a vacuum. We're obviously uh, working with the park staff, but we're also working with a, uh, you know, a writer, editor, and a graphic designer in-house to create an entire brochure. 
uh, and the the graphic designer will be you know selecting the photos that will be on the brochure and oftentimes we will try to match the colors in the photos to those on the map so if we're we have some thematic information that we're showing we might use that bright color of a flower that's uh, in the photograph to also on the map uh, as, as well so yeah there's uh, there's uh, a wide range of colors that we use. We have complete f uh, free range to, to do whatever we want. You know, some of, the, some of the maps and brochures that are about more somber, uh, you know, subject matter, not all national parks are natural and beautiful, uh, you know, might use gray or darker, you know, colors to kind of, kind of convey that, you know, that, that somber uh, mood, for example. Um, but you know, the, the National Park Service maps, you know, do have, certain standards. We have a, uh, a house font, which is uh, Adobe Frutiger. So we, we use only one font uh, throughout. We have our map symbols, those recreational symbols that we've um, already seen on the Grand Canyon map. They're on every, uh, on all of the park maps. We have uh, uh, preferred ways of, of placing type and arranging symbols, our north arrows, our map scales, the, the black title bands, those things are, are all inviolate and, and, uh, and standardized and they don't change. So that's the branding that we bring to our maps. But uh, you know, nowadays the, the maps are uh, you know, essentially custom designed for the needs of, of, of every park. So speaking of the, the palette of symbology, um, there is a National Park Service symbology set in ESRI or ESRI's um, symbology palettes. Um, mm -hmm. Is that one of those things that they they came to you on, or did you go to them and say we really want to share this so that other people can use it? Yeah, um, in, in, in fact, they uh, they came to me, and uh, you know, we have um, after after we're done chatting here, I'll, I'll show you our website, and there's lots of goodies on there, including all the sim symbology in a variety of, of, of different. Um, formats, including Esri styles. And uh, yeah, I, I got in touch with Esri and said, you know, you know, people are asking me, you know, for these, you know, these styles in, in, uh, you know, you know, RGIS, let's, let's get them up there. And I, and I worked with someone at Esri to get the styles up. This was done, you know, maybe 10 years ago, and they're a bit out of date um, right now, but you know, they are um, available in that, in that basic form right now. Um, we we have all of our uh, our map symbols on online. We also have something called um, starter maps, where basically they're layered Adobe Illustrator files with all the elements you need to make a National Park Service map. So people can download those. The type styles, the symbols, and 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 style layers are there, so that makes it, it easier as as well. So. Um... Do you mind uh, sharing with us those websites, sharing your screen again and sharing the websites and showing yeah. maybe a little bit what you do in Illustrator? Uh, and sure, I'd, take I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Goodbye, PowerPoint, and let's look at... Uh, let me find my. Yeah, here's the uh, the the National Park Service um, what we call our Cardo uh, website. If you go to www.nps.gov/cardo, C-A-R-T-O, uh, this is where we have all of our maps on online. Um, there's some really kind of cool stuff up here. You know, the first thing you'll see is a, a map of the United States, and if you just park. Click on any of the state uh, uh, states on the map. You'll you'll find a list of the uh, the park maps you could download. Uh, before we go there, I, I want to show you something that's really kind of cool. Um, you know, 25 years ago, we had a a panoramist from Austria, Heinrich Baran, uh, paint a number of panoramas of of the national parks. Here you could see the uh, thumbnails of them. These were all digitally remastered uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, these things are huge. These are, are posters that you could download. They're, they're about 40 inches um, wide. They're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, download these, print these things out. Uh, I think you'll just, just love them. 
Um, but that's just uh, an aside. Let's go back to that uh, this list of stuff. Um, for example, you know, here's, uh, you know, National Park Service, you know, map symbols, you know, you could see, you could, you know, download all of the symbols that we have. Oh, and, and we, we literally have hundreds of them now. You can see that there is style for um, ArcGIS. You can download those, patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all available um, up there. But let's, uh, let's look at a, uh, a National Park Service map. We'll uh, go north to Alaska. So here's all of the uh, Alaskan uh, national parks. Let's go on to uh, Lake Clark, a place that you probably haven't heard um, too much of. It's west of um, Anchorage. Uh, you can see that the uh, the map is available in a variety of different formats. You can you know get a, a JPEG such as this, and just you know for screen viewing to get an idea what the uh, the park looks like. Uh, you could download a a geospatial PDF and use that in like say the uh, Events and Maps app on your mobile device, uh, and it's it's geolocated. So you, uh, while you're in the park, you uh, you'll see the little blue dot showing where you are when you're hiking a trail. And also you could don't, uh, download the Adobe Illustrator layered file and also the shader relief that's in Adobe Photoshop uh, format. These are the, uh, the original print production files uh, that uh, we use to, to print the maps. So, you know, you, um, anyone out there gets the, um, you, know, you know, everything that we create, everything's in the public domain. Uh, and I, I find it, it's just really cool when, you know, whenever I would make a map, I would put it on the line and just just knowing that you know you know thousands of people you know can download it use it or if they want to, you know use that map to do something different you know make a you know a shower curtain or a handkerchief or whatever they want with it um, for example uh, national geographic uh, last year came out with a atlas of the national parks and what they did is they they went to this website downloaded our maps and uh, modified them more to their style and then and reprinted them and uh, I think that's just a, a wonderful um, thing to do. But let's uh, let's take a look at this uh, at this map of um, Lake Clark. I um, downloaded it earlier, so you wouldn't have to watch uh, the download process on my slow Wi-Fi um, at home. Here's the um, the the uh, the map opened up in uh, Adobe Illustrator. Um, on the right, you'll notice the, uh, this is kind of the heart of Illustrator. It's the, uh, the the layers palette. You'll see these little eyeballs and locks. If if a you know label is uh, or a layer is unlocked, like say black type, that means you can actually go in there and select that um, type and and edit it. I'll lock it and it uh, that disappears. If I want the black type to disappear, just click on the eyeball and all the black type disappears, the blue type disappears, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, uh, very you know, intuitive and, and easy um, that way. So you, here you can see you have the complete uh, layered file. We'll just start from the, the bottom here. And what this is, is the, the shader relief um, that I rendered in Natural Scene Designer showing the terrain and the, uh, the glaciated areas. And on top of that, I, what I simply did is start you know, building all of the other additional layers. Here's uh, non-park land, here's preserve land, here's the park area, native corporation land, uh, the water fill, and you can see the, the, the map is just you know, uh, being built layer by layer by layer. Here's the National Park Service uh, ribbon, which is no longer a ribbon, but more of a vignette nowadays drainage lines, coastlines and, and rivers, you know, trails, roads, blah, blah, blah. And here it all, you know, starts, you know, um, going on um, to the map. Now, one of the things that I, I, I mentioned earlier, um, that's just really, you know, cool about using Adobe products is all this, the special effects that you can use. Uh, for example, let's, uh, let's go up to the uh, upper left here where there's a little inset map and a, um, a legend. You know, one of the things I did is um, on this thing, let's see, the legend, inset map, legend mask. What I did is uh, so that the uh, legend and the inset map would show up better is I masked out everything underneath it. I just created a, I put a, a mask underneath all those rivers and all that terrain. And if I select that mask, what you can see is it's just uh, kind of a boxy um, shape. 
But what I did to that in Illustrator is I, I took that beige box and I applied uh, blur to it. So if I remove that blur, you could just see that it's just a, uh, a sharply edged uh, box. But with the blur, everything is very soft, it fades out, and it just looks more uh, natural. You know, what I could also do to this if I wanted to is, is play around with the opacity on that. Uh, you know, right now it's at 100% opacity, you, you can't see through it. But if I brought it down to say 70%, that allows a little bit of the background to show through if that's what you wanted um, to do. Also, um, let's look at the inset map itself. It's on the layer just above it. I'll just toggle it on and off. If I select the inset map, You'll notice that the inset map has a little bit of a, a drop, drop shadow on that. Uh, here's the drop shadow layer. What's really cool is you create these, uh, these graphical effects and you can go, go back in and edit them uh, at a later time. For example, if I wanted the, the, uh, the drop shadow to be not quite as wide as it is, let's change that uh, four to a two, click okay. And you can see how the drop shadow gets a little bit smaller. I can make it darker, lighter, change the direction of it. Uh, you know, all really you know fun stuff um, to do. Let's um, also take a, um, a look at the um, the water. Uh, you'll notice that the water has um, got a, a little bit of a vignette, a kind of a darker blue edge um, along the shore. We'll go to the layers palette and find the water fill layer, here we are. Turn that on and off. Okay, we've, we've got that. I'll unlock it and you know click on it. So here's the, uh, here's the water uh, layer. You know, suppose we, um, we wanted to make that, that vignette along the shore um, a little bit uh, darker. I could just go in here, here's the inner glow, and I could play around. Well, let's, let's actually make it, um, well, what do I want to do here? Let's have some fun. Let's make it, instead of darker, let's make it uh, lighter. Let's uh, change it to white. Click OK. And now we have a white glow along the shore. Suppose we didn't want it so wide. Let's uh, make it half as wide. Uh, and let's see. So now it's narrower and, you know, Actually, what I think I'll do is also uh, diminish the opacity to say half as much as it is. And so now we have a little bit of a white glow instead of a darker blue glow along the shore. I think I prefer the darker blue uh, glow, but you could see how easy it is to uh, manipulate stuff. Um, if uh, we wanted the center of the water to be um, a little bit uh, you know, darker, you know, we see that it's 17 cyan, 3% magenta. Let's just crank up the cyan a little bit, maybe add a little bit of black to it as well. And so now the, uh, the water's a, a deeper um, blue. Now, what's really kind of cool with the way we work is you know, we, we have just you know, all of this graphical firepower just you know, at, our, at our disposal in, um, in Adobe Illustrator. But this, this map is, is completely uh, geospatial. Uh, we use the Avenza Map Publisher GIS uh, plugin, and, and there's a whole separate array of tools in Illustrator that you could use uh, that are Map Publisher. And uh, let's just um, take a look over here. You, you can see here's my, uh, here's my, my map view layer. Uh, we see this is the, uh, the projection. I'll just double click on this. Uh, you know, it's what Mercator, we can see the scale here, we can do what we can do projection transformations, change the scale, rotation, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's really quite uh, powerful. Uh, what we could also do is, you know, you know, suppose, um, you know, this map, you know, came up for an update and the park said, you know, you know, we want to, you know, add uh, a road to it, for example. There's really not too many roads in Lake Clark, but let's uh, add a road. So you know, we'll just go to um, you know, file, import map data. This is again through Map Publisher. Bring up this uh, dialog here, and we'll go and look for some roads. This is uh, trans uh, a transportation coverage that I downloaded from the, uh, the USGS uh, just earlier. 
as an example. Uh, we'll bring this in using the Web Mercator projection that this map is in. Click OK. And boom, you'll, you'll see you know, all of the roads appear. Now, you won't see too many of them in the park. Most of them are outside the park over here on the, uh, the Kenai uh, Peninsula. Let's just go take a look at um, these roads here. And you know, again, you know, you know, Map Publisher brings you know GIS capabilities to um, Adobe Illustrator. So if I, I click on that road and we go to the attributes uh, columns, we can see all the uh, the uh, database attributes associated with that road. We see that it's you know its name is uh, Marathon Road. I'll just copy that right now. And and if we wanted to select the entirety of Marathon Road, you know, we could just write a, uh, an expression. In fact, I, I did this already just as a uh, show and tell example. I put Marathon Road in here, uh, save and select. And so what it does is it selects um, everything that's uh, you know, uh, labeled uh, Marathon Road on the transportation layer. And this is where, th um, you know, once we have that road selected, this is where things really can start getting um, very um, cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something uh, quite interesting at this point, or at least I think it's quite interesting. And layer palette down. What I'm gonna do is this, that little uh, red square that you see, that's that road object that's selected. I'm gonna, uh, I know it's an unpaved road, so I'm gonna drag that road object down to the unpaved roads layer and look what happens to it. I'll turn off the other roads that we just imported. And you can see that it's you know, automatically styled as an unpaved road. Um, this, you'll see this little dark dot against the unpaved roads. That means that it's a styled um, layer. So I'm gonna um, actually select all of that again. I'm gonna join that. Um, and this is kind of interesting. If, you know, suppose the park you know, came to me and said, um, Tom, um, we have an edit. We know that this road you know, actually goes out around this lake and then joins back up again. You know, can you please you know, edit it? And I would go out and find some imagery, use that as a reference template. And then I would just digitize that in. I'm using the pencil tool right now in Adobe Illustrator and boom, there's that road edit that's been uh, made. What's also very cool about this is that, you know, I'm working with uh, targeted layers that have styles attached to them. Right now we're on the unpaved roads layer. If I was to drag that object to the trails layer, for example, look what happens. It uh, automatically just turns into a trail, drag it back to the uh, unpaved road, and it turns back into a, uh, an unpaved uh, road. So yeah, we're uh, we we have a you know a completely uh, geo-referenced geospatial map here that can be easily updated. Also, it means that stuff can be exported out of this. If I want to do editing to any of the objects, you know, in the attributes table, I can just export these things as shape files or in in other geospatial um, formats. I could take the whole map and export it as. Uh, because this map is in the uh, Web Mercator projection as web mapping tiles, so this you know act, this map could actually be used you know on Google Maps as like an overlay um, to see like you know the National Park Service map of uh, Lake Clark. So it's it's a powerful um, suite of tools. Uh, but what I you know one of the things I really love about working this way in Adobe Illustrator is you know just the ability to tweak the map to uh, to my heart's uh, content. Let's just look at the, uh, the black type layer, for example. Um, I spent a lot of time you know, placing types, so it's just exactly in the right spot. Here's these mountains, you can just move them around. I could select the endpoint here, grab this, uh, this Bezier curve, and just change the, the shape of this label. Let's uh, look at these mountains instead. I think it's got curves on both ends. I could take this Bezier curve, move it down here, bring this one up, and just get these labels just so, play around with the tracking so that the, uh, the label is spaced out uh, in, in whatever way we want. Um, you know, earlier I was telling you about uh, my, my problem with uh, moving symbols around. 
uh, with that lodge symbol at Devil's Puzz Pile, I had something like this. And I was just, you know, moving things around saying, okay, I'm gonna, I need to put a new uh, visitor center up here. And basically what I did is I, I forgot the symbol that was down there. And that's what people were walking through the woods trying to, uh, trying to, uh, to find. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's essentially everything on this map is, uh, you know, uh, editable and you could just essentially do whatever it is you um, want to, to to stylize it um, any way you want. You know, I, you know Shannon, let's um, open things up for um, questions now. And, and, uh, anyone... I already have one um, oh. that has come in while you were talking. Um, one of the one of the students wanted to know if the data itself, um, things like shape files or geo databases are available for download. And it's funny because I was like, oh yeah, I know where that is. And when I clicked on it, I got some 404 errors. So I don't know where it is. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the, the, the short answer to the question is uh, no. The, the, the uh, data that went into making this map is we don't re-release the data. We're consumers of it, just like you guys are. <laughs> uh, you know, all, all the, the data that goes into these maps uh, are in the public domain. We get them from the National Park Service, the uh, the USGS, um, you know, state sources, uh, local sources, etc., and 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 reuse the uh, the data. Uh, having said that, though, it, it is possible to export these data files from um, Adobe Illustrator. For example, you know, suppose we wanted Little Lake Clark here. Ooh, and actually, I got all of Lake um, Clark, uh, just selected it. Um, and, and suppose we wanted to export that uh, data layer. You know, what I could do is go into Map Publisher, and this would be on the, let me see which, that's on the drainage layer. We'll just uh, go to drainages here, if I can find it. Da, 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 da. And as you're finding that, um, I placed into the uh, the chat for the students um, the links to tutorials for um, Avenza's Mac Publisher, and I also um, linked out to where you can get a free trial version download um, because I had a couple of students that were asking about that. Yeah, it's uh, you know, the free uh, uh, trial version is uh, for two weeks, mm -hmm. so yeah, you can get quite a bit. Uh, done in the two weeks, uh, but but I, I will say that uh, you know Adobe Illustrator, Adobe Photoshop, Map Publisher, like all you know, complex software, really does take quite a bit of uh, time to uh, to master. Um, so um, so anyway, here's this drainage layer. It's it's in in Map Views, and what I could do here is just go here and say export um, drainage. Uh, this is going to put it as a shape file in my uh, my desktop. Um, and uh, let me just do that. And so we'll go back in here and I'm gonna turn off my drainage layer. And what I'll do is I'll just re-import that shape file that I just exported. So let's uh, try that. Import map data, multiple data import. Let's browse around, see what we can find. Go to the, uh, the desktop. Oh, there's the drainage um, shape file, okay. We'll bring it in on that map view and boom, there it is. Uh, it comes in with default, uh, you know, thick black lines, but you know, we can style these to any, uh, you know, any, you know, you know, style we, we want. So, you know, um, although we don't, um, you know, make the data available, if you get one of our maps because it's geo-referenced in Map Publisher, if you wanted to, you could, um, you, you can export the the data out but you would need map publisher to do that so does anyone else have a question feel free to turn on your audio or your video if you do or put it into the chat we have a um it, william and mary we have a, several professors who go back and forth about north arrows whether they uh, are required or not required so what is your opinion on north arrows required or not required Kind of, oh, can I can kind of weasel out of this and say sometimes they're required, sometimes they're not. <laughs> My answer too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, 
it depends on the map. I'm, you know, I would say you know a map of this sort. Um, yeah, you probably want to have a north arrow on here. Um, you know, uh, I, I think most people assume that maps are north oriented, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you know they're they're rotated a little bit. Uh, you know, the direction is uh, skewed. If that's the case, I would say you know definitely you want a north arrow in, on the map to indicate that it has been rotated. You know, also if the uh, if especially at smaller scale maps, if you're say showing you know all the United States, the contiguous United States. And if it was in the typical, you know, Albers equal area projection, which is a conic projection, mm -hmm. if you were to stick a north arrow on, on that map, uh, at any given spot, uh, it could, the north arrow might be correct, but because it's a conic projection and there's this kind of arc to the, uh, the lines of latitude, in other areas on the map, the north arrow would be incorrect. So you have to be very careful in using north arrows on, on conic maps, especially at small scales. Okay. Any other questions? I have one last question. Uh, actually, I have two. Um, oh, fire away. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, John mentioned um, when he was with us, uh, he actually brought up one of your shaded relief maps from um, Shaded Relief. Um, the Shaded Relief website. Mm -hmm. And um, so we know that you're involved with that. Um, and you're, you know, you've shared a lot about what you have done with the National Park Service, but would you share just a little bit about what you've been working on in retirement and um, a little bit about NASIS uh, for my students? Okay. Yeah, before I uh, get into that, um, mm -hmm. chat, um, I, I want to mention that um, I was contacted by my, my old office um, last week. Mm -hmm. They're going to be hiring a cartographer, hopefully, um, later this year. And the, the program they're doing the hiring through is called the Recent Graduates um, Program. So the, uh, the hires are open only to uh, recent graduates of university um, um, programs. So, um, you know, keep your, keep your eyes out, open for that. You know, you know, realistically, I mean, with the, uh, you know, with the shutdown and so forth, uh, this won't be happening, you know, anytime, you know, soon, but I, I would expect later this year, there'll be an announcement, a job announcement out there um, where, you know, uh, they'll be hiring, you know, someone to, to make maps of uh, Lake Clark and all the other national parks. And I will say it's a fantastic uh, um, job. I mean, not only are you mapping the national parks, you're also going out to visit the national parks uh, with the teams, uh, the writer, editor, and the designer, field checking the map and, and just seeing just wonderful places across the, uh, the country. So, um, but you asked, you know, what am I um, doing in uh, retirement? One of my big projects has been the um, Equal Earth uh, projection and, and maps. Um, uh, what I, I did with uh, a couple colleagues uh, is we developed a new equal area world map um, projection, had it published in 2018. It's now available in, uh, in most mapping and GIS software, in, including um, ArcGIS. And uh, along with this new map projection that, that shows all area, areas of the world world at equal scale. So, you know, Greenland is no longer as large as Africa, for example. Um, I went ahead and made uh, a series of maps based on that projection um, uh, that are released online for people to, uh, to download and, and print. Okay. You, know, <laughs> you know, something, my iPhone is right here. And I think, hey, Siri. Sorry. <laughs> I, heard, I heard something. Uh, yeah, so so um, these um, these equal Earth uh, maps. If you if you um, uh, Google equal Earth dot com, you'll 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 find them. Uh, no, there's um, these maps are available centered on um, Greenwich, uh, England, uh, zero. Also, 90 degree west over the Americas and 150 east over the Eastern Pacific, Australia, and East um, Asia. So, depending on you know what area of the world you live, you could download the map that's more or less centered over your region. And what's more is I've been have I've I've recruited um, uh, teams of uh, translators to translate the map into other languages besides um, English. 
presently there's um, seven uh, other languages available uh, besides English, and I have six translations uh, in the works right now, including uh, Chinese and uh, Arabic, uh, Catalan, Finnish, and, and, and so, some others. And when these maps are uh, translated, I put them up online and those maps can also be downloaded. Um, they're available as, you know, big JPEGs that people could view online or uh, print out on a plotter and also the, uh, the layered uh, Adobe Illustrator files. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's been a, a, a big um, uh, project of mine. Um, I'm, I'm also uh, working on uh, natural earth data, um, the naturalearthdata.com uh, website, uh, where you could find small scale mapping data of the world. I, I put that online some years ago with Nathaniel um, Kelso, and uh, uh, that needs continual updating, so I'm, um, I'm, I'm doing that. And um, also working on just kind of pet map uh, projects. I mentioned uh, Prince William Sound, uh, Alaska, uh, uh, that I finished up uh, a few months ago. And right now I'm thinking about doing a, a new physical map of the United States and I'm starting to, um, to prep um, data for that. So yeah, this is my retirement. Um, <laughs> doing a lot of mapping, but I, I, I want to assure you that I'm also doing lots of other fun things as well. So, it's nice not having to show up to an office anymore. Right. Well, uh, we Shannon, you had another part to that question, didn't you? Well, and I have, I have sort of a, a last question um, for you because most of the students in my class are at the beginning of their career and you are in this blissful part of your career where you get to choose the projects that you want to do. Do you have any last minute of or like Final advice um, for our chat today for these students on um, cartography or you know their career as cartographers or maybe using GIS or any of the anything that you would like to to say to them um, because I remember I can remember when I was introduced to GIS and was fresh starting out and I have lots of advice but um, but I feel like your career has been so interesting. Um, yeah, it's also spanned uh, a, a lot of different uh, technologies. Uh, I mean, when I when I started off my my career, um, you know, I was I was doing you know you know pen and ink um, drawing. So I mean, it was really back in the uh, the dark ages. Then you know, actually went into the dark room, did a lot of photomechanical um, mapping, and you know, it's 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 been just very interesting from my perspective seeing the these sweep of changes. Uh, I'm. It's, it's, it's interesting, when I started off, I, I had these heroes in the cartographic world. Um, I mentioned Heinrich Baran, the panoramist from Austria, Vignelli, Hal Shelton, who did natural color mapping. And you know, I, 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 I would look at their work, you know, and, and these guys were largely artists. And it's like, you know, you know I'm not an artist. I, I can't achieve that. But uh, lo and behold, uh, along came the, uh, you know, the, the digital revolution and you know nowadays you know we have all kinds of data wonderful you know gis and mapping and graphical tools available and what i found is that you know with uh, with uh, a little time a little perseverance uh, and practice you know uh, someone can achieve you know these 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 masterful maps that you know that only could be made you know 50 years ago by exceptionally skilled artistic um, cartographers. So all of that now is within uh, reach. And, you know, you know, my concluding, you know, thought is that, you know, I don't think there has ever been a better time to be a, a map maker, a cartographer um, than right now. I, I have to agree with that last sentiment. Um, I really want to thank you um, for your time today. And if everybody wants to unmute and say thank you, that's totally fine with me. Um, so much. Thank you. We really do appreciate you coming and joining us. Um, and like I said, we're recording it, so we'll put it up on YouTube and then I'll send you the link. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> it's been my pleasure, folks. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning in and uh, stay, uh, stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Tom, if you'd like to um, stop. I